stage of the service with that wonderful anthem. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And he proclaimed and declared, he is the great I am. And you know, there are things that parade themselves and, and shout into our lives and say, I am big, I am large. Things like COVID and, and uh, financial difficulties and problems and health issues. And they shout like a Goliath and they say, I am great, but there is only one great I am and that's Jesus and he is greater. He is far, far greater. He's high above all principalities and powers. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you caused us in this worship time to focus not on the problem, but on our Savior. Not on the difficulty, but on the King of glory, who says, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Lord, we pray that in this word today, you will speak to us. We will hear your voice from the throne of glory. That this won't be a sermon in a church. It won't be Steve Moss speaking, but we'll hear the voice of King Jesus himself speaking over our lives. Speaking what? Speaking truth that cannot be shaken, but also speaking life that he imparts to us and speaking power and authority because he is the king. Let your word be truth and life and power in our hearts. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As I was uh, preparing over the last several weeks for the word this morning, the Lord brought me to and took me to a, 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 a section in the Old Testament, uh, one of the laws of Moses, one of the things that we read about. And it's an interesting thing that when we think about the Old Testament and the law, we tend to think about the Ten Commandments. And we are aware of them. We're familiar with them, many of us. They're the do's and don'ts, if you like, of God in terms of how we need to behave. But there's many, many, in fact, there's 700 different commandments and ordinances and decrees that God gives in the Old Testament. And many of us aren't really aware of that. In fact, many of us don't focus or concentrate on the Old Testament. We focus on Jesus in the New Testament, which is brilliant that we do focus on Jesus. But you know, there is a strain, there's a stream of teaching in the kingdom uh, which is heretical. And it says, we're now no longer under the law, we're under grace, so ignore the Old Testament. Focus on the new. No law, forget the law. Well, that's simply not true. And it's not what God wants. And I was looking at a particular aspect of this and realized that when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, he was not just giving a group of do's and don'ts, rules and commandments that the people needed to hear. He was actually giving them a way, a whole culture and lifestyle and way of living free from Egypt under God. He was sharing with them and showing them how not to live like slaves anymore because they'd lived all their lives as slaves in Egypt. They didn't know what freedom was. They didn't know what responsibility was. They didn't organize their lives. They weren't able to make things happen because they'd lived as slaves forever. So when God gave the law, he was revealing to his people how to develop and live in a culture, a lifestyle of living free and living under God. There are laws and decrees in the Old Testament that talk about health, they talk about hygiene, they talk about how to deal with mildew and mold when it comes in your house, they talk about relationships, they talk about finances, they talk about dealing with uh, difficulties, they talk about agriculture, it actually talks about the whole lifestyle of living free under God. I don't think we can ignore that, do you? I don't think this is a bunch of rules that we can say we're in the New Testament now. God speaks through all of his word. And there was a particular aspect of that that he led me to uh, in the law of God, in the Old Testament. And it's called the feasts of the Lord. And I'm going to just summarize this and read a few scriptures for you here. What God ordered the people to do was a commandment. He said, you need three times every year to gather together, come together, 
And in that time, you're going to have what I'm going to call a feast or a festival or a celebration. And you're going to take a whole week or more to come together and you're going to do certain things in that feast or that festival. First of all, you're going to make offerings to me. You're going to pray to me. You're going to praise. You're going to celebrate. Secondly, you're going to gather together. Thirdly, you're going to have days off work. That's good news, isn't it? Do you know God uh, sorted out bank holidays before the government did? Did you realize that? That the first and last day of these feasts was usually a day you couldn't work. You weren't allowed to work. They could celebrate. They had great praise times. They had get-togethers and parties. They came together for a great festival. God was doing festivals well before Mother's Day and the world got hold of anything. And he said, you've got to do this three times a year. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. The first one was Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 to 17. It'll come on the screen for you, but open your Bibles if you've got them. And he says this, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep, first of all, the feast of unleavened bread. That was what the first feast was called. And you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And that first feast take pl took place in the Jewish calendar on the first month. It was, it was April. That was the first month of the Jewish year. And that was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then it says, after that, and then the Feast of Harvest, this is the second feast. The first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field. That's the second feast. That was six weeks later. We'll see that in a minute. And then there was a third feast in the year, in the seventh month of the year, called the Feast of Ingathering, where you have gathered the fruit of your labors in the field. Three times a year, all of your males shall appear before the Lord your God. So there were three feasts in the year. And they were to do with harvest. The first one was the barley harvest. That was in April. It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Took a whole week, day off at the beginning, day off at the end, eating unleavened bread, lots of gathering, lots of prayer, lots of worship, lots of offerings. Fifty days after that was called the first Feast of First Fruits or the first Feast of Weeks as well. And that celebrated the wheat harvest, the second harvest of the year. And they would do the same. They'd gather together. They'd have a day off. They'd celebrate. They would worship. They would pray. They'd make offerings. And the third feast of the year in the seventh month, about September time, which is kind of when we have our harvest festivals, isn't it, interestingly? This happened way before then. That was called uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was when the grape harvest came in. And there was a great celebration. And that lasted over a week. And again, they had, uh, they had days off at the beginning and the end. And part of that, they, what they did was they made tents out of um, big branches. And they lived in those tents for a week. And they celebrated and rejoiced and, and talked about God being with them. Interesting, God said, three times a year, I want you to gather and celebrate for a whole week, take, take time off work, a festival or a feast. Here's a little bit more detail. In Deuteronomy chapter 16... Uh, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 16. This is the longest scripture today. And it says, Observe the month of Abib, that's the first month, and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd and the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. And eat no unleavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and that is the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you and in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any meat uh, which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight till morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, that means in your home, uh, but which the Lord gives you, the place where the Lord chooses to make his name abide. That's in the, the, the capital and in the great temple. And there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast it and eat it in a place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. And six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. That's the first one. Includes Passover, 
Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know about Passover. The second one, verse 9. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle in the grain. And then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, but you shall be careful to absorb uh, observe these statutes. That isn't just the men, that's everyone celebrated together, the Feast of Weeks. And then the final one, verse 13. And you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press, that's the grape harvest, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your Levite, the stranger and the fatherless, the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place where the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you all your produce, all the work of your hands, so that you shall surely rejoice." Three times a year, all your males appear before the Lord your God in that place, which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. See, what God's saying here is he's establishing in the year calendar of the Jewish people three huge festivals, three feasts, These are times for them to gather together, to come together. And it includes everyone, the widow, the orphan, the son, the daughter, the father, the parents, the grandparents, Levites, even the strangers who live with you. Come and gather together and celebrate and sacrifice and pray and have great times of fellowship with each other and with God. He said, I need you to have on your calendar these three special feasts. I wonder why. Just going a little bit further, um, I'll leave that one. It's another one from Exodus describing the feasts. This was given to Moses when they were in the wilderness. Okay? The two million Israelites have left Egypt, they're living in the wilderness, and God says, I want you to have these feasts every year. Three times a year you've got to have these. Actually, they're all about harvests. But there's no harvest in the desert, is there? He said... When you get the barley harvest and the wheat harvest and the grape harvest, celebrate. You don't get any barley or wheat or grapes in the desert. You just get sand. So he said, whether you get wheat or not, whether you get barley or not, whether you get grapes or not, three times a year, gather, celebrate, pray, make sacrifices, enjoy each other's company, have a whole week, take time off work and gather. And it wasn't just when the Israelites were in the wilderness. We find that, I'll just read, it's just three verses. In Hezekiah, that's hundreds of years later, when they'd settled in the promised land, there's no more wilderness, they've got harvests. And in 2 Chronicles 30, 21 to 23, it says this, the children of Israel, who were present of Jerusalem, kept the feast of unleavened bread for seven days with great gladness. There was a lot of celebration that went, took place in these feasts. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. If you thought this was loud, every day they had songs and praise and instruments singing during this feast. Great celebration. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they ate throughout the feast for seven days, offering, making peace offerings, a confession to the Lord their fathers. And then, listen to this. And then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast for another seven days. So they had a second week. They had such a good time in the first week. They said, we're going we're gonna, to we're keep this going for another week. What a festival that would have been, don't you think? Did that sound like a party to you? Does that sound like a whole nation celebrating to you? Yes, they're praying, they're making offerings, but they were singing and praising God and hearing the word seven days, and then they did it for another seven days. Without looking at it, Josiah, uh, a young uh, young king, uh, celebrated the Passover in 2 Chronicles 35, and he said the Passover, there's never been a Passover like it. He said it it was the biggest celebration the nation has ever seen, seven days. 
And then way, way later on, hundreds of years later, after the people of Israel had been taken captive into Babylon, taken captive and lived in Babylon, and, and this is de- centuries later, they came back to Jerusalem. God led them back to Jerusalem. And under Ezra, what they did was they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles again. See, this didn't finish when they were in the... This wasn't one of the laws of God that stopped in the wilderness. God said, you need to do this. And, and it says, without reading it too far, it says, um, since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, of Nun uh, to that day, Israel has never celebrated with such great gladness. Man, they had the biggest celebration for seven days. Jesus, in John's Gospel, chapter 7, makes this statement. You'll be familiar with it. He says, let all who are thirsty come to me and drink. For out of your inmost being will flow rivers of living water. He spoke that at the last day of the Festival of Tabernacles. The feasts were still going on in Jesus' time. Jesus' death and resurrection took place in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It never stopped. What was this all about? What God was saying was, if you want to live in freedom under God, you need to make sure the part of your year is marked out for really great celebrations and gatherings. These festivals were markers in the year. They were time set aside that the people would plan for, that they would look forward to. They were huge events. They were great celebrations. They would would have programs ready for it. They would prepare for it, and they would greatly enjoy it. Every single year, without fail, whether you were poor or rich, sick or well, young or old, three times of a year, you would set that date in your diary, and it was there a whole week's worth, off work, All of it, praising, worshipping, singing, um, and repenting, praying, gathering together, having incredible get-togethers and celebrations. God said, you need to do that. And you keep doing that. Why? Because we need markers in our life, that's why. We need things to look forward to and plan for. We need things that are set up that we know are going to happen. We need things that we say, oh, April, we've got them. We've got Easter, haven't we? Isn't that right? And we've got Christmas. We've got different things. These are feasts or festivals and events. Now, let's bring this into the focus that God wants for you and I this morning. All sounds a bit theoretical. See, what COVID did was it stripped away most of the things that make life normal for us. And it stripped four things away from our lives for over a year. First of all, it stripped away fellowship because of COVID and isolation. You know this, whether it was lockdown or whether it was you can't gather as a family, whether it was you can't gather in your church, whether it was you can't be next to someone, you can't be close to someone, you can't give them a hug, you can't do this, this. And for 15 months, we struggled with being isolated and lacking fellowship at every level. That leaves a huge, huge gap and consequences. Secondly, what COVID did was it robbed most people of collective worship, at least the worship that they knew. So even when churches were able, and this is all over the nation, indeed all over the world, but certainly all over our nation, when people gathered together, eventually when they were able to do, and some churches still are not meeting in their buildings, they're still having YouTube online services, okay? They haven't met for 15 solid months physically with each other on a Sunday in their church building. But those that did meet in their church building were socially distanced. They had to wear masks. They were not allowed to sing. They were only allowed to hear singing. So collective worship, as we knew it, was robbed us. And indeed everyone all over the world. What amazing and awful consequences that had on gathering and worship, on our connection with God 
and our connection with each other for 15 months. Here's the third thing that COVID robbed from us. It robbed our programs. Not just in church, but at home, you know, in the workplace. In other words, the things that we did regularly, the things that we planned and sorted out and did, they all went. Isn't that true? And indeed, there were some very positive things about that because many churches are way too busy with too many programs. But you know what a program does? It establishes a rhythm and a routine in your life. And we need rhythm and routine. That's why our hearts beat regularly and we walk regularly and we breathe regularly. And what COVID did was it took all the routine away. All those family occasions, all the birthdays, all the weekly church services, all the meetings that took place in certainly our church and every church, it didn't happen anymore. All the, all the gatherings, all the things that we do suddenly went, apart from one or two people, uh, like poor old Tim here who worked harder over COVID uh, than most of us did when we were actually out of it. But most people, the routine and rhythm of their life, of our life, was stolen and taken away. And the result of that was we all felt purposeless. We felt we were drifting. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't, I don't know about you, I didn't know what day it was at times. I, didn't, I had no markers like the Sunday or the Thursday meeting or the Tuesday. Or the, all, the, all those had gone. And all the rhythm and the routine and the purpose and the momentum of our lives was taken away. And then the fourth thing it did was it took away the markers, the birthdays, the wedding. The funerals, Christmas, Easter, family get-togethers, all those special occasions. We had, we had our 40th wedding anniversary uh, last Christmas, but we didn't do anything for it. There was no party. There was no get-together. All the markers, all the important points in our lives, we couldn't gather to celebrate. And that had an effect. I was ministering to someone just a couple of weeks ago. And they said, you know, I've got such a problem. I'm feeling restless, unsettled. I'm, I'm annoyed with myself. I'm annoyed with people. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt, you know, I'm negative. I'm, and it's not me. It's not like me. And I said to them, you've just been through COVID for 15 months. How many of us still feel restless and not very happy and not quite there? We don't quite know what we're doing. Are we going to go to plan B? Is COVID going to get worse? Are we going to have this? Are we going to do this? This person was saying, I've, you know, normally in my organization, we, we've, got, we've got our plans and programs worked out. We don't know what we do. We just don't know what we're doing. This is what we've been walking through for 15 months. Now maybe we can understand why we've been struggling. I put down here the results is we were disconnected, isolated, Lacking purpose or plans, no rhythm, no routine, no big markers or events or occasions for our focus. So we are restless, drifting, disconnected, unhappy with ourselves and with others, unsure, anxious, don't know what we're doing. That's the result of COVID. Not just the physical results, but the results on us and our groups and our communities. Would you, that's massive, would you, would you not agree? Absolutely massive. Now, we come to the reason why God led me to this area of portion of Scripture. Thankfully, with the easing of restrictions, we can meet together. So we can have fellowship. We don't have to be isolated. Thank God for that. That's beginning to come back. We can now have collective worship. That's why you're all here today. And we can sing our hearts out. And we still got to trust in God because COVID's around, but we can at last gather. We don't have to wear masks. I can now see what the rest of your face is doing instead of just seeing you from the eyes upwards. So it's great. We can, we can talk to each other. We can fellowship. We can have coffee with each other. We can meet together. Wonderful programs we're beginning to start to find that rhythm again with the Sunday worship and the cell group meetings as a church we're beginning to gather and get that momentum and get that direction and get that that routine and rhythm into our lives markers well not yet except the Lord said there's a feast coming 
This is our first feast as a church for nearly two years. And it's the feast of Christmas. And God said, I'm giving you a feast. I'm giving you a marker. I'm giving you something to plan for, something to look forward to, something to prepare for, something to enjoy. I'm going to give you something where you're going to be taking time off work, where you're going to be worshiping, where you're going to be praying, where you're going to be singing, you're going to be celebrating, you're going to be sharing, you're going to have fellowship, you're going to have a marvelous, marvelous time. Who remembers last Christmas? Do you remember last Christmas? Pretty difficult, wasn't it? Four days we had to sneak in a family get-together and it was locked down before and locked down after. We had no Christmas program in the church at all except for flyers, basically, and posters on our windows. We did stuff as best we could on DVDs and YouTube. We did as good as we could. But it was a Christmas that just seemed so shallow, so much less than what we're used to. And we had to do it because it was a healthy a health scare, a crisis for us. Not this year. Not this year. So I'm going to share with you, just in the next 10 minutes, what we're going to do for our feast of Christmas this year. Because I don't know about you, but I'm going to celebrate like mad. I'm going to love it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to be sharing the gospel. I'm going to be gathering with my friends in the church. I'm going to be gathering with my family. Now, I know things may escalate, and we'll work on that. But the key to this is, what are you believing for? What are you looking forward to? What are you going to prepare for? Is it time for us? We've already stepped up in church. We've already stepped up with our worship. You heard those songs this morning. The roof nearly came off. We've already stepped up, and Jesus said this to me. I'm going to give you a marker. It's called Christmas. There's a feast coming. So go for it. Let this Christmas be the best ever this year. Are you up for that? Yeah. Oh, four of you are. <laughs> Let me share with you just the things that we have got planned for this year. First of all, we've got the shoebox appeal. And that's happening right now. I hope you're filling your shoe boxes. We're hoping to send away 50, 60, 70 of these to Romania. That's taking place. Uh, and the last uh, time for that is November the 7th when you've got to get your shoe boxes in. So they will have a great Christmas. Whatever COVID's doing, the children there are going to have a great Christmas. Uh, you know the instructions for that. Fill as many as you can. Bring them into church. We'll house them in the, uh, in the craft room. And that's taking place now. Secondly... On Saturday, the 27th of November this year, we're going to have our Christmas tabletop giveaway. We're going to do it again this year. We couldn't do it last year. It may be slightly different because of COVID, but what we do for that, those of you who are new to the churches, you look in your home and you look around and see if you can find really, really good quality, fantastic, brilliant items that you can come and bring to church and we're going to give them all away to our neighbours to anyone who wants to come. We're going to give them, we don't charge them, they're free, absolutely free. We don't take offerings. We gather in this room. We've got tables all around the room. We've got clothes, we've got DVDs, games, bric-a-bac, furniture, books, the lot. And I'm telling you, I've never seen people queue outside a church before, but the last four or five years, apart from last year, they were queuing outside our church, and there are crowds of them in here, and they take absolutely masses of brilliant items. What a blessing. We're going to do it this year. Couldn't last year. We may have to limit numbers or get something in there, but we're going to make it happen. Are you up for that? Some of you have got stuff in your houses that it's time to get rid of them because you haven't been able to get rid of anything for the last 16 months. But I want to share this with you. We're going to change it. In previous years, we've had so many clothes given to us that the tables have been stacked too far high. You can't see the clothes. So please don't bring bags and bags of clothes. There's too many. What we need is, number one, winter clothes. Don't bring summer clothes. It's not summer, right? <laughs> you know, bring winter clothes. Bring really good quality clothes. Do not bring your cast-offs. 
but bring, there's about 60 people in this room. I'm telling you, we'll fill tables. So bring good quality furniture, if it's really good quality, books, DVDs. We're gonna, and we advertise it. We put flyers right down the street. And the people in our street, and they didn't just come from our street. They come from the community, because word gets around. Oh, that church is doing that tabletop thing again. Let's come. They're going to come from all over, and we're going to bless them. And every one of them will get a tract, and it's a Christmas gift. That's worth doing, don't you think? This year. Next one, first time this year, um, Jenny has prepared a, an Advent prayer booklet for the four weeks of Advent, and that will be given out to us on Sunday, the 28th of November. It's got a 10 minutes reflection for you to just have 10 minutes prayer each day. That's going to everyone in our church, not just our church. Most of the churches in St. Anne's, in a meeting that Jenny was at recently, agree they're going to try that as well. So hopefully we're going to get all the churches in St. Anne's congregations on the same day praying the same prayers for Advent. It might even go into Blackpool. That's good news, isn't it? We can do that with or without COVID, can't we? Great. Next one. We used to go to Porrit House, which is a lovely home for retired people uh, just down the road here. Great relationship with them. We go carol singing there every year. We couldn't do it last year, of course, because of COVID. We can't actually visit this year because of COVID, but what we can do is make a DVD. I spoke to Mandy, the manageress, and shared with her, and I said, no, we can't come. She said, no, you can't. I said, what about if we make a DVD? She said, we'd love that. What we'll do is we'll have a big party. She said, I'll have a big party with our residents. We've got a great big screen. We'll show it. They know us, you see, the group that go. We'll do Chris carols and we'll introduce them and we'll do it. We'll record it. We'll put it on a DVD and they'll love it. So we'll get to share the gospel, COVID or not. Each year we've done outreach in St. Anne's Square of some sort or another, except for last year. This year, we wondered, would we be able to do something outside? Well, the answer to that, because of COVID and social distancing, is a resounding yes. Because at the end of November, there's a switch on of the lights in the square. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people gathering together. There's a blessing of the crib at the end of that. There are, so the council is saying, you can gather. It's okay unless they change their mind. And if they don't change their mind, we're going to have a group of us singing carols in the square, hopefully on Saturday the 11th of December. December. This is all in your newsletter. 11th of December, we're going to get out there, proclaim the gospel. We're not going to take very long because it's freezing in December. But we'll take long enough to share the gospel, preach and bring carols and announce the good news to the people. We're going to do that this year. Are you up for that this year? Get well wrapped up, but that's what we're going to do. We're not doing the wandering nativity. Sorry, Jack, but uh, we're going to keep it as simple as we can. Sunday, the 12th of December, you'll all receive at least 30 flyers with a Christmas gospel message in to post down your road as we do every year. We're going to do that. Uh, and we're going to do some cards for the churches together as well. Um, so Sunday, the 12th of December, we've been having our family celebrations, which are great. Great, great time, great time. We've had two of them now, Sunday afternoon at three o'clock. Uh, and we're having another one, and that's going to be a Christmas party to end all Christmas parties for families in the area. Sunday the 12th, going to be great. Tuesday the 14th of December, we're going to have our Christmas and Friends meal. That was pretty poor, wasn't it? I'll try that again. We're going to have our Christmas and Friends meal in the Glendower Hotel. All the trimmings, everything beautiful, you know, candles, all that, etc. cetera. Um, Catherine Gallica, where are you, Catherine? Can you put your hand up there? Catherine's organizing that. You need to, it, it's 20 pound a meal. That sounds a lot, but they've actually given us a discount to even do that. Uh, if you want to go see Catherine and book, because the places are going to go really, really quick. Christmas meal. Sunday the 19th of December, we're going to have our Christmas do-it-yourself nativity. If you are a visitor to this church, you will love it. That's all I'll say. Sunday the 25th of December, yes, we will have a Christmas Day celebration live, not on video, live in this place. And last, the year before last, we had 55 people who turned up for our Christmas Day celebration. I mean, they were, they were lying in the place. And we do, we do, low, we have great praise. We do some craft. We do some interactive stuff, preach the gospel. The kids stay in. Marvelous time. It's happening again this year. Is that worth looking forward to? Absolutely. Boxing Day, because Christmas Day is only the day before and Boxing Day is the Sunday service, 
It's going to be difficult to get people together to lead, have worship. So what we're going to do is before that, we're going to pre-record, like we did for YouTube, a proper worship time and a proper preach. And that's going to be shown on. It'll be a DVD shown on the screen here. So if there's anyone, many people won't make it to church because it's Boxing Day. But if there's anyone who wants to come to church to gather, there will be a video of that and you can actually come for that. That's going to be a great celebration. We're going to have a wonderful Christmas. Why? Because it's a feast. Because it's a feast. Now, I want to say this just in finishing here before we, we do. When God gave all the instructions for the feasts of the Lord to the Israelites, there were no harvests to celebrate. So the feast was all about God and people, loving God and loving people, like Tess said at the beginning. There wasn't a harvest. It was just manna every day. There were no wheat, no barley, and no grapes. It was only in the promised land that they got the harvest. So the feast isn't about the harvest. It's about Jesus and each other. So wait for it. Christmas is not about the presents and the lights and the food. It's about Jesus and each other. If there was no food and no gifts, we'd still celebrate our hearts out because it's about Jesus. All of this is on the newsletter that you're going to be given before you leave. Listen to this. Really, really important. There's two choices we can make to finish this year. One is a choice that is controlled by COVID. The second is a choice that is controlled by Christ. And I've got a phrase here that says, not COVID, but Christ. Are you with that? Do you want to say that with me? Not COVID, but Christ. And another one, not COVID, but Christmas. That's a, sorry, slightly different one. Not COVID, but Christmas. Let's have the first one after three. One, two, three. Not COVID, but Christ. Second one, not COVID, but Christmas. Now, let's be wise. We're not being silly with this. If there are any COVID cases, of course, we'll let you know. We will be socially distancing, all of that. Of course, we will. That, but, but God said, I've set a marker for you. And have the best Christmas ever. Because I was still born. I'm still Emmanuel. I'm still God. Can you do that? And I say, yes, instead of the disconnection, the isolation, the anxiety, no marker, no variety, uh, no regularity, no routine, all of that that was taken away and is coming back now, God says, there's your feast. He said to the Israelites, you need to gather together three times a year. It's part of your lifestyle of freedom under God. This Christmas is part of yours and my lifestyle as freedom under Jesus. So we can celebrate it. And I'm looking forward to it. Praise God. Are you looking forward to it? I think you are. Get yourself ready. Anticipate. And, and enjoy. I think that word enjoy has been out of our vocabulary, most of us, for 15 months. It's time to enjoy Jesus. Enjoy each other. And enjoy the gospel. Amen? So we're going to enjoy something as we finish today and that is we're going to have a song to finish and it's a song you can enjoy okay we've chosen a particularly enjoyable song here and it's it's called God is good all the time okay so I'd like you to stand with me we're gonna enjoy Christmas we're gonna enjoy the Lord we're gonna enjoy each other but we're gonna enjoy him right now today whatever else is going on Jesus is Lord, God is great, He is the I Am, we are saved, we are blessed, and He's a brilliant God. So I'm going to hand you over to Dave and Linda, and they're going to lead us in that last song. <clears throat>